was around 1977, and uh, I was working for Fleetway magazines, in, uh, for a magazine called Battle. And uh, then they decided to make a science fiction magazine called 2000 AD. Fleetway, who was publishing the British comics, they hadn't, for 20 odd years, they hadn't uh, produced any science fiction because science fiction just wasn't selling in comics. Comics were football comics and various action comics, but no science fiction. When it was first being developed back in 1976, early 77, um, it was, they, they knew that a, a science fiction film was coming out in the summer of 77 called Star Wars. So Fleetway thought, well, let's produce a science fiction comic and see how that goes, and it was 2000 AD. I had been editor of other comics and had created for one of them a sort of Dirty Harry takeoff called One-Eyed Jack. And so when Pat Mills was putting together 2000 AD, I said to him, the one thing you don't have is a tough cop. I went away and wrote the story using the name Judge Dredd. He was so standout. He's a good guy and he's a badass at the same time. It's a, an irresistible combination. So they call me for this new character that uh, John Wagner has created. They say he was a judge, jury and executioner, all dressed in black and driving in a motorbike. Practically, I pick up the idea, but then I just start elaborating and uh, I go over the top, just putting eagles and uh, a big bike. Part of the reason Dredd has seen such a successful character and has continued for so long is, is due to the, the fantastic design elements of Dredd. His uniform is instantly recognisable. It's, it's such an amazing design, isn't it? I mean, I think it's up there with Spider-Man, Batman and Superman, you know, it's just one of the most iconic looks, you know. He's probably one of the most iconic British characters that's ever been appeared in British comics. And the, the gun, the lawgiver, which can fire six different types of bullets, that sort of really, really appealed to sort of like the teenage boys that were, were picking up 2000 AD back in, you know, when it first started. And the lawmaster with its huge wheels, the big eagle on the front, the, the bike cannons. I think originally Young was not very happy with the the character I draw. But the editor in, in that time, Pat Mills, he really liked it, and uh, so they changed the script to adapt to the, to the character I draw. At the beginning, when 2000 AD first came out, it wasn't clear that uh, Judge Dredd was going to be the standout character, because there were a lot of other good characters in that uh, story. So it wasn't, it, it took a little while for us to, to realize, you know, just how good Dredd was. And Dredd appeared at just the right time. It came after Punk, you know, and, and just was the right character for the right moment in the right country at the, the, precisely the right time. Because of the Thatcher era, there was this tendency to see the government of the day as a rather right-wing Conservative Party, as a right-wing situation we were all in. Judge Dredd had a rather fascistic look to him. He was to, supposed to be the representation of justice. Justice has no uh, face, so he was covering all the face. I tried to make something like the, the hood of a middle-aged executioner, covering the face totally, only letting out the chin. That was quite important. In those times, he looked very um, futuristic figure, but today, 35 years later, any policeman looked like him now. It was very rigid and uniformed. There were sort of little hints at sort of Nazi uh, symbology, the, uh, the little glint in the eye had, was a sort of SS symbol, although it really is just supposed to be a glint. The protection in the shoulders, in one of the, of the side, I put an eagle. The eagle is the representation of the American eagle, but also could be a fascist symbol, since the Romans, the Nazis, and Spain, where I was living, under the Franco regime. He represents the law, uh, uh, unflinching. He has ethics, but at the same time, he's the embodiment of a fascist justice society. Judge Dredd represented this sort of police state. The other star of the strip was the city he lived in, Mega City One, which was a sort of an anarchic, anti-establishment sort of environment. So he was the policeman who policed all this chaos. It's often said that Mega City One is much a, a character in the Judge Dredd strip as Dredd is himself. And it's such a huge environment for which to tell stories in. 
and um, it's a great sort of play box where you can do anything basically. There's, you can tell sort of very human, down-to-earth stories or you can do these huge epics in which the city comes under, uh, under threat. The city is as much a part of Judge Dredd as Judge Dredd is. You have such an almost infinite number of people in that city, squeezed into that city, so you have an infinite amount of stories and Dredd is the thing that links all of those crazy stories together. Where the, the strip comes alive is other people's reaction to him or the other characters' reaction to him. Um, that could be in the city and the citizens um, because Mega City One is just this bizarre, bizarre place that Dredd is often becomes the straight man to, to whatever weird crime or um, characters he's coming up against. Just enforcing the law no matter who's doing what. He's, he's not changing who he is. There's not a character arc. He's not, you know, there's not a romantic the lead that's brought in and you know you don't care what he's doing after hours like this is what he does this is who he is dread is and always will be just that so as long as that's the case i think you're gonna have good stories around him so he's your anchor for every one of those stories he's almost rod serling at the start of a twilight zone episode you know because he's the one consistent thing in a universe that seems to be constantly shifting and changing we attempted to make dread as humorless and unattractive as possible so that we sort of identified with the adversaries, the mutants who were being kicked out because they had three arms or whatever, the fat people who were... Uh, it was illegal to be fat. Dread is so satirical in the fact that it's reflected, you know, society as it is now and then made it, pushed it further in its absurdity into the future. And John Wagner and Pat Mills' writing enabled them to make certain comments about society but keep it within a science fiction context. So you got the sense that there were these sort of outsiders. They weren't the New York comic creators, which is what I thought every comic creator was. They're actually people in other parts of the world creating comics and commenting on American society. And I think that's what gave it its unique viewpoint. You know, this is people looking at what we're doing over here and who's running our country and how things are being handled. And they've got a completely different take on it. Part of the reason why Dread is set on the eastern seaboard of, of America is, is because it has this huge scale. It's, it would be very difficult to imagine something like this being set in Britain, even though the the comic, the comic is, is British and also enabled the writers to go even further with the absurdity because they could kind of see some of the trends that were coming from America and then extrapolate them into the 122 years into the future where, when Dread is set. It's a typical British humour. Looking at America in that way is like exaggerating all the, the cliches that is you know, in, in the state. It was books like Dread and Nexus that were commenting on politics and things that you know, these other books didn't do. They had superheroes fighting supervillains, and that was about all they ever did. They had no commentary behind them. So when I'm reading these things, and there's this like sort of wickedly sarcastic take on uh, American culture, um, I didn't maybe get the nuances in the storytelling as much then as I do now, but you know, even then I could tell there was something different going on. Because 2000 AD is a weekly, and Dread appears in it every week, there's been a huge number of stories published over 35 years. But there's been some particularly big stories, those which we usually call mega epics, which have, which have usually last about six months or so. First of those was the Cursed Earth, where Dread managed to cross across the, the irradiated wasteland. And that really developed the world of Dread beyond the Mega, mega City 1. You sort of got to see like, these cloned dinosaurs and mutants running rampant and all this stuff. So that's sort of a, quite a, that was quite a high benchmark quite early on, sort of back in 1979. And then you moved to like, you had the day Lord died when Dread was um, accused of murder and you had the insane Judge Cal. Then you had the Apocalypse War, which is half the city got nuked by the Soviets. Then you had Judge Death. So all these, all these, all these stories are really, really popular. Dread always been like an open comic for the same for writers as for artists. Each one has, mm, uh, they have not been um, forced to follow the story in one way, but uh, each, uh, each person has had total freedom to, to carry on with the, with the stories. Dread is probably one of the most consistently, brilliantly written projects. Uh, you know, for 35 years, John Wagner and Alan Grant have done the most phenomenal job, and the other guys like Garth Ennis and Robbie Morrison and so on come in, have all done a, an amazing job. You know, I mean, other writers have handled it, but John Wagner is still the guy, and I think everybody, you know, from Garth on down, will admit that nobody writes a character as well as John does. It's one of the beauties of Dread that you can tell any kind of story. You can tell an outright comedy, you can tell a tear-jerking tragedy, you, you can tell a political satire. Uh, anything goes in Dread because you've got this vast city. Most of the writers really got the gist of Judge Dread. It, it was funny, really daft humour, 
with occasional bits of horror and, and gritty violence. It's funny, actually, I would say I was probably the worst writer who ever worked on this <laughs> Like, what made it awful is that I love it. You know, I really do like it, you know, but I didn't grow up with it. So I had no idea what I was doing. Plus, I was too young, you know, like, uh, I came in when I was 19 and John Wagner, Alan Grant, Pat Mills, all these guys were suddenly kind of lured off to do American work at the time by Marvel and DC. So they, they just had this kind of vacancy, really, you know, and I just happened to be walking by and somehow ended up doing these classic characters. And I, I genuinely didn't have a clue, you know, what, what I was doing. And I was really stumbling around and sort of doing uh, really pretty piss poor stories. Like every, everybody else has been brilliant and my stuff just is like the turd in the punch bowl. One thing that has stood dread apart over 35 years that he's been going is being the huge calibre of artists that have worked on the strip. In the late 70s when it was first starting, you had the sort of Brian Bolland and Mick McMahon who were getting their first work pretty much on the comic. And they really, really sort of um, set the template of Dread, sort of the very heavy black and white and instantly recognisable. And then through the 80s, you had a fairly constant rotor of, of artists like Carlos Esquera, Ron Smith, Steve Dillon, all these artists that helped make the comic stand out. As we moved into the 90s, you started getting people like Simon Bisley, who were like the second generation of artists who grew up reading the comic from earlier. And then they added their own influences, and you started getting more sort of painted artwork, um, very much a sort of stylized look. And then into sort of like the late 90s and 2000s, and you get a newer generation of artists like Jock, Fraser Irving, all these artists that have, again, grown up with this, but bring their own flavor to the strip. And it's enormously enjoyable to see this huge variety of artists working and all bringing their own styles, but also sort of making Dread this really powerful figure, as iconic as he is. As for the Judge Dread comic, John Wagner is still writing it. There's a, there's a weekly in 2000 AD and there's the magazine, which is monthly. In the past few years, we've been making roads into, into penetrating the American market with reprints of our material distributed in America. And we got into discussions with IDW about producing a new Dread comic, which they themselves could put out into the, uh, into the American comic shops. We want to put out new comics and you know, give people new versions of these characters. It's going to be totally different in that Dwayne Swarzynski, who's the writer of this, you know, he's an American writer, so he's going to have a different viewpoint and different ways of telling a story than John Wagner or British writers do, but he gets what Dread is, and so he gets the humor, and he gives you what you expect from these characters, keeps sort of the, the blackness of it, and, and puts that all together in, uh, in a way that I think is exactly what I wanted our Dread comics to be. So they're producing both new new comics, which will have uh, all new Judge Dread stories, which won't be necessarily tied to what's going happening in 2000 AD at the, at the current time, be more reader friendly for any US reader who has, doesn't know Dread and hasn't read a Dread comic before, they should be able to pick up the IDW Dread and he's immediately sort of, you know, follow what's, what's going on. Dread is still Dread and Dread, you know, 35 years from now is always going to be Dread and I think that's a lot of the appeal is that you know what you're getting and so if you like that then, you know, you're going to like it now. So that's the way Dread's going at the moment and hopefully we'll see him going for another 35 years. Um, I don't see him stopping any time soon. I think the, the main attraction of Dread is that he's a combination of good guy, bad guy. In some respects, you're all for what he's doing. In other respects, you think, well, thank God he doesn't exist today. When we created it, we never thought it was going to last for 35 years. To me, he's always been one of the best characters I've ever drawn.